There we go. Welcome, everybody. If you are joining us, it's because you are in the 2324 cohort for monitoring and supervision with us. So as Julie mentioned, this will be recorded. So she will send out a copy of this to all of the directors. So you will have access to this after the fact. If for some reason you don't get that, here's her contact information. So feel free to reach out to her. And this is our team. I am Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator. I get to work with this exceptionally awesome team every day. Um, and before I joined the department about almost five years ago, that's crazy, I was a special ed teacher and I worked primarily with students with autism for 30 years. And today we have Jennifer and Carly with us. So Jennifer, you wanna come on and say hello real quick, please? Yeah, hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, I too was a special education teacher, functional life skills before I joined this team two years ago. Thanks, Jennifer. And Carly is with us. Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau and I joined the team. I'm just coming on one year. And um, before that, I was an educator for 21 years. Thank you. We will have a new team member joining us on the 5th of uh, July. We're excited to welcome her. We'll have more about that at another training. And of course, our Wrangler, Julie <laughs> is here. Julie wants to hi. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I'm the admin support for this fabulous team. Um, I have been with DOE for just about six and a half years. And prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Thank you, Julie. And here's our contact information. I know this is out there. Most of you know how to get in touch with us, but this will be here as well. So as I mentioned, welcome. You are here, hopefully, because you're part of the 2324 cohort as part of that general supervision system that is outlined in MUSER in our main unified special education regulations. And these are the topics that we're going to go over for you today. We're going to review the desk audit process. We'll talk about the self-assessment. And there's something kind of exciting about the self-assessment that Jennifer's going to talk more about. So for those of you who've been through this process with us before, I think this is going to make you happy. We're going to talk all about the due dates. Julie's going to talk about the parent and staff survey. Then, of course, we'll talk about what's next. As we go through, as always, I think we've got some chat box check-ins, but if you've got any questions, if we're moving too quickly for you, if you need us to clarify or back up, please feel free to just come off mute, tell us to slow down, interrupt, no problems, or put it in chat if you're more comfortable doing that, but this is your training. So we wanna make sure that, you, um, that we respond to this in a way that makes sense for you. So what we have done as a team is we have broken up all of those um, teams that are in cohort this year for the 23-24 year. So each one of us will be responsible for a number of SAUs. And in August, each director will receive an email from that contact person, and it will include each one of these documents that are listed here. I'm not going to read these documents because what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to discuss each one of them in, in detail. But what you can expect will be in August, an email from your contact person on this team with each one of these items. One of the items that we will talk about again in detail, but this is just a screenshot of it, includes the due dates for the item, for the, for the activities and the um, the pieces of documentation that we'll be asking you for. So this is the monitoring timeline. This will be, of course, included in the August email, but this is a really important one because this really outlines the due dates for each individual component of this process. So audit, the planning, and the pieces that we are asked to look at they come right out of an OSEP document that uh, we refer to as Memo 0902. And what that simply helps us understand is how we need to break the cap down in terms of the corrections that we look for. And we talk a lot more about that when we get closer to the cap, but it's around that prong one and prong two requirement. 
that stems directly out of this memo. We don't expect you to, to, to um, know the memo, memorize the memo. It's just, we just like you to know where our information comes from. Of course, our information comes from the Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA, as well as MUSER. So we take these three pieces and get what we need in terms of regulatory requirements to help us figure out how we're going to create and look at this cohort. In mid-July, you will receive a letter of notification and instruction from Julie, and it will outline exactly the process, so you'll have a great deal of information in that letter. The very first due date that you need to think about would be that December 1st due date, because that is when your desk audits will be due to us in our monitoring inbox or through snail mail. We'll talk about that as well. One of the things that we put in place when COVID hit and we've maintained throughout is the opportunity for you to have us do some or all of your desk audit for you when we come on site. We understand how strapped everybody is and the field has just been very clear with us that staffing is an issue, that resources have been an issue. So in an effort to support you with those components, if you say to us, I cannot do my desk audit. I just don't have the time. I don't have the resources or the staff. Let us know that. And when we come on site, we are happy to do that piece for you. If you start to do your desk audit and you can't finish it, also fine. Just let us know. There is no due date when you need to let us know, but just you know, try to articulate that to us as soon as you figure that out and we're happy to work with you. These are the required desk audit components. and. The first one is that B11 component. This is a required federal indicator. And it's really important for us to look at this and have a very clear sense of this because all states, including Maine, must report this data as part of our SPP APR to the federal government, to the federal DOE. And this is an indicator that the federal DOE says has to be 100%. And we have to, require, we have to report where we are, where we fall on that. And the B11 is around that child fine. So that percent of children for whom evaluations were completed within that 45 school day timeline. We also, as part of this indicator, look at what we refer to as INR1, which is the procedural safeguards. We look to make sure that procedural safeguards were offered to the parent at point of first contact. So for example, if you have an initial referral, that point of first contact would be at that advanced written notice for the meeting where you're discussing the child's initial referral. So you're, you know, you get together as a team to discuss, we think this child, we want to put this child into referral. These are the evaluations we're recommending. Do we have consent? Where you do all, where you walk through that process? that is considered point of first contact. So what we would want to see when we look for this, we would look at the advanced written notice as an enclosure. Did you, did you make a note that procedural safeguards were sent home? We would also look in the written notice for it. And we could also look at, at that parental consent form. Was it, was it included as an enclosure? We would look very carefully to see when that parental consent, that signed consent is received back, because as you know, that starts the timeline. And then INR3, these are just our codes, you don't need to worry about them, but that's where we would look at if there was a delay and if that was not, that evaluations were not completed, was that an acceptable reason for a delay? And we have a document that outlines that. And we would need to see your 22-23 and 23-24 school calendar so that we are very clear about what constitutes a school day. So if your calendar, if you have a snow day or if there's another reason why school was closed for all students, we would just ask you to document that on the calendar so that we don't inadvertently count that as a school day when we're looking for that, for that timeline. So for this B11, what we would like you to submit would be 10 initial referrals. Those, again, we would look at that signed consent form. And it's really important to note when that's received back in the SAU, 
That can be a date stamp. That can be a handwritten date, however you choose to document that, but it needs to be shown. And then we also look on the cover page of each evaluation for which the parent signed consent for. When was that received back in the SAU? So we look at those components again to make sure that those initial avals were completed within that 45 school day timeline. So um, those dates are really important for us to be able to check that. We will ask you to complete the B11 tracking tool. We're gonna show you that. And on that B11 tracking tool, you are going to document if you have a student that goes beyond that 45 school day timeline, and you're going to document the number of days beyond. If for some reason you have a student that you do not finish the evaluation in time, we're gonna follow up with you either when we come on site to just say, hey, did that eval get done? And if so, can we look at it? Or if we come on site and the eval still not done, we'll circle back to you and make sure that we can look at it to make sure that that circle has been closed. And this is that timeline tracking tool. This is a tool that has been in place for a while. So if you've done this with us before, you've, you've, you've engaged with this, but you can see that each column outlines the specific components that we need to look at in terms of that B11 tracking piece. So column one, we would want the child's last name. Then we would want the consent for initial eval, which starts that clock. Then when were all evals due? When were they received? Then you're gonna count out all of those student days. Did you go beyond? If you went beyond, was it acceptable or not acceptable? And then column eight is yes or no, did you include procedural safeguards, again, at that point of first contact as we discussed previously. This is an OSEP document that outlines those acceptable or unacceptable reasons for delay. This is not our document, so we really just have to operate as it's defined here. So you can see, for example, an acceptable reason to go beyond that timeline would be if the child has excessive absences from school. So you would have to document that. An unacceptable reason would be the parent did not have transportation or they didn't return your phone calls. So if you have a student that extends beyond that timeline, just take a look at this document and try to figure out where it falls and document it on that tracking tool, please. As part of the desk audit, we also look at eligibility forms. We can look at eligibility forms that come from those 10 initial avals, which in my mind, you know, is a nice way to sort of collapse that work. So you can pull seven of those forms right from that initial. If you can't do that, or if it doesn't make sense to do that for you for one reason or another, those can come from re-avals and that would be fine. But we are looking for three specific learning disability eligibility forms three adverse effect, and one speech and language eligibility form. It's also really important that you send in the corresponding written notice that goes with that completed form, just so that we can see evidence that those forms were discussed at the meeting. And we would like to see, we need to see, um, a statement in that written notice and that corresponding written notice that just is simply states that the IEP team reviewed and completed that blah, blah, blah form. So just a statement in the written notice that documents that that form was reviewed and completed. We need to see that. If for some reason you do not have three SLD forms because you're a smaller school district, that's okay. Just let us know what you do have and we'll figure out how to make that work with you. So no worries if you don't have seven forms that you can submit. This is just a one pager that we put together to sort of highlight the things we want you to remember when you're looking at your eligibility forms. I'm not gonna read this, but you can have this for your reference. But again, just make sure that you document the conversation in the written notice and just really take a hard look at those, you know, those forms, make sure there are no blank boxes, make sure that you have data where you need to have data. Um, for the speech and language form, one thing we often see is they um, 
directors will forget to send us or not send us the severity rating scales. We need to see that as well. So just take a look at this. And if you have any questions about any of the specifics outlined here on this one pager, please let us know. B13 is another required component in the desk audit. And this is also a federal indicator, and this is around that post-secondary, those, those transition plans for students. And we look at the percent of youth ages 16 and up with IEPs, with measurable annual IEP goals and transition services. We are asking that you not use graduating seniors because those seniors will leave and there's no opportunity for corrective activity. And we would ask that as part of your desk audit, you send in screeners, two screeners, only section nine of the screeners, please, for the IEP. Um, we will give you feedback on these screeners so that when we come on site to look at your final transition plans, you will have had very specific feedback around any errors we might have found. You'll get feedback on the great things that we found so that your final transition plans will be 100%. This is another federal indicator and the Office of Special Education Programs um, mandates that this is 100%. Our data around this needs to be 100%. So we are very um, motivated to help you with this piece. If you plan on having us do your desk audit on site, we would still ask that you still send us at least these screeners by December 1st, because that feedback piece is really important. Like I mentioned, we'll give you feedback. We're gonna share dates around when we are doing B13 training. We'll look at those final B13 plans on site, and we're hoping that the feedback will help you make any corrections between December 1st and the on site gives you several months to make any corrections and gives us several months to support you as you work to make those corrections. And of course, corrections prior to on-site mean fewer CAP findings for you. So with the B13, this is a change for us. Final B13 reviews will no longer be based on child count. And the reason for that is we're not really getting enough data. Um, we really want to have an opportunity to look at more transition plans just so that we have a better opportunity to really see the great work that you're doing. So when we were on, when we come on site, we will look at 10 full transition plans. If you don't have 10, again, just let us know. No problem. We'll figure that out with you. But when we do come on site, that's the time when we will look at the advanced written notice the written notice and the full IEP. So we'll look at that packet. We are only looking at students who are 16 years or older because that's what the federal DOE requires. And again, not looking at graduating seniors because once they leave, there's no opportunity for corrective action. So there's, there's no reason for us to even look at them. This is another one pager that we put together that helps you see what we're looking for and exactly where we will look to find evidence of that piece. So for example, the purpose of the meeting, when we look at that as part, as part of the final uh, review, we will look to make sure that transition planning is documented on the advanced written notice. Was the child invited to the meeting? Again, we will look at the advanced written notice. So when you're going through and making corrections to your final plans, hopefully this one pager will help you really know exactly where we're going to look and exactly what we're going to look for. We don't want any surprises because we, we want you to do well. So if you have questions about this, let us know. The other components for the desk audit would include this accuracy document. This would be signed by the director. It just stipulates that the information you're submitting to us is accurate. Fund authorization letters. Our guidance would be to include an individual letter for each person who is authorized to commit funds. So if you have five people in your district, you would have five fund authorization letters. 
This is because if you are at an IEP meeting and somebody says, hey, show me the letter that gives you the authorization to commit funds, you want to be able to produce the letter that has only your name on it, not four other people. So please do not send in one letter with multiple names. Please write an individual letter for each person who can do so. Summary of performance is another component of the desk audit. And remember section one must include data and we are asking you to submit three summary of performance forms to us as part of the desk audit as evidence that they were given to the child prior to exiting high school. So as you know, this summarizes the child's academic achievement and it is required under the IDEA. So please submit three. If you don't have three, let us know. Policies and procedures. We are asking that you submit a letter of assurance to us that just states on district letterhead that you reviewed your policies and procedures around referral, child find and restraint and seclusion, and that if they are out of date or if that any changes need to be made, that you will make those changes. If you have recently broken from an SAU, an AOS, or some, there's been some change in your organization, please let us know and we will ask to see your current policies and procedures around these three pieces. Abbreviated day. This is something that we were tasked with as a team to really take a hard look at. So what we are asking is when we come on site that you have the files available for any student who was on abbreviated day in the 23-24 school year and we will review them on site. What we look for is the process. And this is a link that will take you to a professional development we did around abbreviated day. So it will walk you through the, the regulatory expectations. And this document talks about abbreviated day for educational reasons. And much like the B13 one pager I showed you, you can see exactly what we're looking for and exactly where we're going to look to find it. The big takeaway from abbreviated day is make sure everything is clearly documented in your written notice, because that is where we are going to pull and look for most of the information around if you have a student on abbreviated day. So this and this for medical, this will help you really know, again, where are we looking and what exactly are we looking for? So hopefully these two documents will be helpful. Teacher certification, you will only be contacted by us if there are certification errors. If you do not hear from us, you're great. Don't worry about it. You're all set. And as I mentioned several times going throughout, if you do not have all of the components of the desk audit as we've outlined, just contact your member of the DOE team and let them know and that person will work with you to figure out exactly how to move forward. We understand that it can change from, you know, a larger district to a smaller district. No worries, we'll figure it out. All right, Julie, could you please come on and talk about the parent and the staff survey for me? Sure. Um, the parent survey, um, you will receive information mid-August um, via email. Um, I usually send a group email in the middle of August at some point. It will include um, a link and a QR code to um, directly to the parent survey. The QR code is something new. We started last year and it was well received, so we're continuing with it this year. Um, we leave the survey open all year, so it doesn't close till the end of June. So we ask that you continue to share the link and QR code throughout the school year. Um, many districts will do it either at open houses or IEP meetings, um, newsletters. <clears throat> Some districts will even designate a computer in the school, either in the library or the office for parents to come in and use. Um, you will get emails from me once a month, usually at the beginning of a month, and it will give um, survey updates for um, the parent survey. It's a total of the cohort surveys completed, but if you would like a um, 
total for just your district, all you have to do is email me and I can send you that information. Um, the data for the survey is usually available in August. Um, that's about it for the parent survey. <laughs> the staff survey, you don't get till later in the year. Um, that comes by email as well. About a month before your um, on-site visit, I send out a confirmation email. We ask for some information like location and things like that. But I also include a link to the staff survey. And we ask that you um, share it with staff prior to our visit. It's a quick survey, only takes a few minutes. Uh, maybe about 10 minutes, and um, that data as well will be available in August. Fantastic, Julie. Thank you so much. Sure. And just an FYI, we have received feedback that the staff survey seems to be um, limited to case managers in terms of the way it's worded, that it really, it, it, it's been hard for related service providers or ed techs to offer feedback. So we are taking a look at that and hopefully we'll be able to uh, amend that before you receive it. All right, that was a lot of information. Are there any questions or is there anything I can go back and clarify? Or are people feeling okay about what we went over so far? I can't see the chat box, so I'm relying on my team to let me know if there's anything that we need to focus on. We did have a question in the chat box about um, the 45 school days. Um, does the meeting have to happen within the 45 school days? And I put the Muser citation in the chat box. And yes, you do have to have the meeting within those 45 days. Thank you, Jennifer. Perfect. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to let Jennifer take over. All right. Self-assessment. So I'm going to start with be patient with us. We are... Um, we have a new process for self-assessment that hopefully will be easier, but um, you are our first ones to use it. So it's brand new, so there may be bugs. But I think if you have been in cohort before and you have done that horrible EMT spreadsheet, this will be much easier. So for your self-assessment, um, we would like you to please choose IEPs across disability categories, ages, all of your case managers, ethnicities, all of your schools within your SAU. Um, if you tuition, if you don't have a high school and tuition students out to high school, those as well. Um, we also ask for at least one student from each out of unit placement. And this can be um, SPPS, regional program. If you place a student out of district to another SAU, um, MECDHH, those um, sites, if you have any students to go to either of their sites, at least one student from each of those places. And please do not um, use graduating seniors. So the number of files that we're asking you to review are based on your child count. Um, so you could see it says zero to 49, 15. If you have like 20 or fewer, um, or maybe it's probably between 10 and 20, just do 50%. If you have less than 10, we'll probably look at all of them. Um, so other than that, just pull from this grid. And when we come on site, we will look at the same files that you looked at for your self-assessment. Um, and if you have had an annual review in between, we will change those minuses to pluses. Um, all right, again, one student from each out of unit placement for your self-assessment. And then while we're on site, we will also, in addition to looking at those IEPs, we will review the process of placement for any student who has been placed within the past two years. So we pretty much look at all of the students that you've placed in the last two years just for the process. And then we look at the IEPs as well. Um, so as we alluded to, you don't have to use the EMT anymore. Yay. Um, we've moved to a form that you can fill out. So with your August email, you will get a link to your specific 
form for your SAU. And if you have IEP coordinators or case managers that are helping you, you know, with the self-assessment, you could send the link to them and they will all be consolidated into one file. So I'm sure you used forms before. So it's just the same information on the EMT, your student information, name, date of birth. Um, there we go, date of the annual IEP meeting. So this is the date of the annual for the IEP that you're looking at. Um, if the student attends a school outside of your district, so this includes any of those out of unit placements, um, if you tuition to a different district for high school, um, if you tuition to a 6040 school, anytime a student attends a school that is not part of your district, put that school there. Case manager, you could do that however you like. Um, it'll have you'll choose the disability identification. If you click multiple, it'll come up with a little um, box for you to write in those concomitant disabilities that make up the multiple. And then it just goes through each thing that we look at. So you could see at the top, RAE1, they all have codes. You do not need to remember them. We don't even remember them half the time. It's okay. Um, also, you could see next to RAE1, it says section 4A. That tells you where you're looking on the IEP. And then it gives you the IDEA and user citation. So you can look at why we're looking at this thing. And then it has an explanation of what makes this compliant and what makes it not compliant. And you're just going to click yes or yes, it's compliant or no, it's not compliant. If you click no, it will bring up a little box to ask you why. Why is it no? Why is it not compliant? So you just put a little note in there. You do not have to write a lot. Just a couple words is fine. Um, next one, AFS1 is strength, section 4B. Again, it tells you what makes it compliant, what makes it not compliant. If you click yes, it doesn't give you that extra little box. And it just goes through everything we look at. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so when we, we yeah. sorry, so don't, those were just, and that was just intended to give you a snapshot of that. We'll train you when we do the how to choose your IEPs for your self-assessment. We'll, we'll walk that, we'll walk through that, those forms more specifically. So don't, that was just to wet your whistle, so to speak. There you go. All right, so when we come on site, we will look at the, again, those same files that you used for your self-assessment. If we did your desk audit for you and you didn't do a self-assessment, that's okay. We will just go through the files ourselves. Um, we do like to sit down with staff to review files. We know that you are woefully understaffed. And um, so if you cannot have staff available for us to review files with, that's fine. Um, I could tell you from experience, when I was a teacher, I sat down for this review and it was the best PD I ever had in my life. So um, it is encouraged, but we understand if you can't do that, that's okay. Um, if staff is able to participate, we do give contact hours for that, because again, it's really good PD. Um, if you have programming you would like us to see, we love to do that as well. Um, again, we understand if you just don't have the capacity to do that, that's okay. Um, as Colette said, we will look at 10 transition plans. Um, if those are part of the files, the IEPs review, that's good. They can be the same as the um, screeners you sent or totally different students, either way, it's fine. We will look at all of your students who have been or are on an abbreviated day during the 23-24 school year. And we will review the process for students that are in, that were placed out of unit within the past two years. And Megan put a question about that. Um, yes, it would be as of the day we're on site two years back from that. 
So yeah, probably the 22-23 or 23-24 school year. Um, all right. So we will go through all of this while we're on while we're on site. We will talk about next steps, answer any questions. So you don't really have to remember all this, but just so you know, um, on the Friday of the week that we are visiting you, hopefully, um, there might be a few weeks where we're still traveling on Friday, but we try to keep them open. You will get an email from your contact person with pre findings. Pre findings are anything that is about 95% or better or compliant. So it's not a systemic issue. It's usually a one off typo or something like that. Um, and we give you the opportunity to fix those. You have 30 days. 30 days is a little loose too, if you need more time just to ask. Um, and if you choose to do those, these are absolutely optional. If you don't have time to do these, that is absolutely fine. It's just an opportunity to correct things that aren't a big issue and um, they won't show up on your cap. Um, we will also send you a comparison of your findings from your last audit to this one. And it's just a little FYI thing, you know, oh, this one went from, you know, 50% to 78%, good job. If there are areas that went down since your last audit, we will send a link to a training specific to that thing. Um, and it's just for you to do with what you will. It's just for your information. We are not tracking whether you watch the those trainings or anything like that. It's just for you. Um, we have moved, we are moving to more of a um, results-based accountability system. Um, so we started with this current 22-23 cohort, a tiered support rubric. So there are four tiers. Um, tier one is pretty much perfection, really hard to get on tier one. Most of you will fall in two or three. Um, tier four is you need a lot of support. This is often districts that have a lot of turnover, have had a lot of special ed directors, that kind of a thing, and they just need more support. Um, we piloted that level of support last year with two districts. It was very well received. Um, and both of those districts closed their caps within a year and are doing very well. So when you get that follow-up email after your on-site visit, we will send you the rubric, but you won't know where you fall on it until you get your cap. And also a copy of the IEP quick reference document, which is a handy d, &D tool. It goes through every single thing we look at, where we look for it, and what makes that compliant? What does that look like when it's compliant? So all of your corrective action plans will be issued on June 30th, 2024. And at that time, you find out where you fall on the rubric. And all corrective activity will be due on April 30th, 2025. When you send evidence, um, please clearly label that um, so we know where it's coming from and what we're supposed to look at. I know um, Colette had mentioned memo 0902. And one of the things that says is that if we see noncompliance, we have to ask you for correction. And then we have to ask you for evidence of systemic correction. So we need more things. And then if that's not compliant, it just snowballs into a big nightmare. So if you label what you send in and we know exactly what we need to look at, we will not look at anything else. We are very careful about that. Um, if you have questions about the self-assessment or if anything goes a little wonky with it, please reach out to your contact person. Like I said, this is our first year doing it with a form. Um, you know, there's always little bugs, but even with bugs, it will still be easier than that EMT, promise. 
Um, you can submit your evidence to monitoring.doe at maine.gov, or you can mail it to Julie and she will make sure it goes to the right person. And that goes for your desk audit and your CAP evidence, everything can go there. Um, in September, you will get an invitation to how to choose IEPs for your self-assessment, where we go through every thing that we look at and we talk about what makes this compliant. Um, we really want um, we really want you to know ahead of time. So, and again, when you do your self-assessment, if you notice areas that um, your staff is struggling with, and you fix those things as annuals come up, we will look at that new one when we come on site and change those minuses to pluses. So um, B13 training, we have scheduled for October 11th at one o'clock, January 9th at nine o'clock and May 2nd at one o'clock. Um, and that link is to our professional learning page where our recordings are not to the calendar, but um, we do have a bunch of recordings of prior trainings and IEP modules there at that link. So that is also a handy place to go. IEP training, October 11th at nine, January 9th at 1230 and May 2nd at nine. Um, so when we send out this PowerPoint to directors, we will make sure we correct that link. Thank that you, Jennifer. Link to the um, calendar, thank you. All right. All right. Just some things to keep in mind because these are things that we see all the time. Um, so we recommend for section 4C, 4D, and 4E, those distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps, bullet them out. Sometimes we see these really long narratives, which are very nice, but it's really hard to tease out those specific skill gaps. And the more you write, um, the more likely you are to maybe identify gaps you didn't intend to, and then there's no goal to address that gap. And so then there's a, an alignment issue. So if you bullet those gaps, then you'll know if you have four bullets, you should have four goals. Um, which brings us to the next thing. Every gap in section four needs a goal to address it and that we look at that in both directions. Um, so when we're looking at section four, we make sure every gap has a goal, but then as we're looking for goals, we make sure that every goal also has a gap. Make sure you include your how statement, how those distinctly measurable and persistent gaps affect the child's progress and access to the general education curriculum. Present level. Your present level is your baseline data for that goal. Um, so please do not include those subjective words like sometimes seems to often struggles with. Um, don't use ranges, um, less than, approximately, about. Be really confident in your data. Just this is your baseline data. Even if, if the child is new to you and you are just doing a quick probe, at this moment, this is their baseline data. There it is. Um, present level cannot be blank. This is an IDEA requirement. So if the child say has no academic gaps, they just have functional in that very first academic present level, that's where that statement that the child is on par with peers or however you wanna word that statement goes. And same goes for functional. Um, avoid goals that have multiple skills, outcomes, or measure with spe specific curriculum. And we will go into detail about that at the How to Choose Your IEP training. And there is also a module on our professional learning page about this exact thing. It's probably 45 minutes or so. Um, alignment, every goal gets a service, every service gets a goal, make sure you have alignment with those as well. So gaps to goals to um, services and backwards. All right, we have some resources. The IEP quick reference document. Um, this will come in your August email. It is also on our website. Um, 
Well, the one on our website is for the 22-23 cohort right now. We will update it for 23-24, and we will also put it on the website and send it to you in the August email. Um, oh, here we go. This is it. The procedural manual also on our website. This goes through all things special education required forms. It goes through every form in great detail about what you need to put in every section. It is a handy DND tool to have at your fingertips. Abbreviated day. Um, we just started looking at abbreviated day because um, the courts are really looking at this pretty harshly. Um, so we want to make sure that um, all your paperwork is in order so that you don't get caught um, with that if you end up in due process. So there is a recording, a uh, short, it's, I think it's only about 30 minutes, and it tells you what your documentation needs to look like for abbreviated day. And these are the things that we will look for when we come on site. And that is it. Do we have any more questions? I don't see any more in the chat box. Great. All right, Carly, you want to hop on and talk about this one? Sure. Okay, so this is our professional learning feedback and contact hour form link. Um, or QR code, you can access it either way. Uh, and there are just a few questions about our professional development. We really appreciate the feedback and we take it into consideration when developing new professional development. So um, that would be great if you could fill that out. And then you can also receive a contact hour certificate for attending today's training. And so if you want that, you can just say yes and enter your email. Um, you'll just select the cohort training, and then when it asks which cohort training, you'll select the SAU charter training, because that is today's training. Um, and then you'll get the contact or certificate, also a copy of this PowerPoint, um, the IEP quick reference document, and the procedural manual and music. So there are a bunch of goodies that come along with the contact or certificate. Thank you, Carly. And here is our contact information one more time. And I think that's it. Does anybody have any other questions or is there anything we should go back and clarify um, before we give you back a little bit of your morning? No? Okay. Well, you know where to find us. And please feel free to reach out to us at any time with any questions. If you have any concerns about the process or you need us to help walk you through any component of it, that's what we're here to do. We want to work with you. We want to support you. We want this to, to be as smooth as possible. So please feel free to reach out to any of us. You will be assigned a person, but feel free to reach out to any of us if, if, um, if that works for you. So if there's nothing else... We will let you go, and I hope you all enjoy your day. Maybe the sun is out where you are at. It's not where I'm at, but um, fingers crossed we'll see it before the day is out. So thank you all so much for joining us, and let us know how we can support you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.